Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the Newark and Sherwood series, a district of 84 civil parishes right in the centre of Nottinghamshire. Come with me as we delve into one of them. Welcome back to Newark and Sherwood, everybody. Now, the next three episodes here in this district will center around a village called Winthorpe. And there are some strange bits and bobs uh, which don't fall within Winthorpe Village, that actually fall within the other two villages I'm doing while I'm here. And one of those things is this level crossing, because this is Winthorpe level crossing, but it doesn't fall within Winthorpe Parish, and neither does the Cricket Club, which is just beyond this towards Winthorpe. They both fall in the parish of home. This Newark and Sherwood video is sponsored by Past Days, a family history blog by June Terrington. You'll find a link in the description. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Home in Nottinghamshire sits on a dead-end road off the A1133 Newark to Gainsborough Road. This is a quiet, very rural, very peaceful place on the eastern bank of the River Trent. Although on the eastern bank now, it used to be on the western bank. As we discussed in the North Muscombe episode, in 1575 a huge flood caused the River Trent to change its course. That meant home was all of a sudden cut off from North Muscombe, the parish to which it once belonged. The changing of the river's course had an effect in more ways than one. Holmes Church of St Giles and Langford's Church of St Bartholomew both predate the flood and as such used to be on opposite banks. These days you can walk between them in under five minutes. Home doesn't appear in the Doomsday Book. Its earliest mention is in 1160 when it was referred to as Holm. The name Home is believed to be Danish in origin meaning island or marshy land. As early as the 12th century, the area was trading in wool, contributing to Newark's status as an important trading town. This wool was the most sought after in Europe, much of it shipped to Flanders to be woven into cloth. Wool was so dominant that at the beginning of the 16th century, there were about three sheep to every human being. Home is still very small, so it might still be the case. There certainly weren't many people around. Let's have a look at it then, shall we? We start at Winthorpe Level Crossing on Home Lane. Arguably, this is Winthorpe, not home, but the way the boundaries are, it means that this falls within it. Again, this is the Lincoln to Nottingham line. The line here has a speed restriction of 50 miles an hour. Some 79 trains use the line every day, which might sound a lot, but when compared to the nearby East Coast Main Line, it's nothing. Winthorpe's Cricket Club is close by, and so too is the River Trent. Just to the north of where we are here is a former sand and gravel pit known as Winthorpe Lake, popular with fishermen and with walkers. The lake is a graveyard for barges. One of its most iconic landmarks is a barge which has a tree growing through it. Seeing as we're not walking around the lake, I just had to find a picture of that. Now, I don't know whether you can see this from here, but I'm as high up on the riverbank as I can get where I'm stood. You can see the A1 in the distance, just there where my finger is. 
and it crosses the Trent, which you can see definitely, okay? And there's a bridge just there. Now that is Winthorpe Bridge. Now I can't get Winthorpe Bridge into the Winthorpe episode because even though there is a footpath, it's on the other side of the Trent here. I don't think you can walk down this side to the bridge. I think you have to be on the other side. Uh, and so for that reason, I'm gonna talk a bit about the bridge here. So here's a special section about Winthorpe Bridge. It's got quite an interesting backstory. Winthorpe Bridge forms the A1's crossing point over the River Trent. Such are the parish boundaries. Half of the bridge is in Winthorpe, the other half is in South Muscombe. It's what's known as a concrete box girder bridge. It forms part of the six and a half mile long Newark bypass and it was built in July of 1962. It was constructed by a Danish firm, Christiani and Nielsen. Ten tree trunks were unearthed during the building of the foundations, which were thought to be half a million years old. The design is a graceful three span structure in continuous pre stressed concrete. It measures some 520 feet in length and it's 82 feet wide. Many Winthorpe residents can recall with pleasure some of the workers who lived here for several months when the bridge was being built. In total, 16 bridges had to be constructed for the bypass, this being the most important. One of the signature sounds of its construction was a banshee-like wail of the pile driver working in the night. So now we're in Home Village itself. You've got two ways to access this. You can either come from Langford on the A1133, turn off it and come down this road here, or you can come from Winthorpe the way I came uh, from where I showed you a few minutes ago. And we're starting here at the church. And whichever way you come into Home, it's a dead end because beyond the church, you've got a, a right turn which leads to a dead end and a left turn which leads to a dead end. It's pretty much the end of the world, this place. Let's go and have a look at the church to start things off. Holmes Church is dedicated to St Giles. Now, despite looking and feeling very old, this one dates from the 15th century, making it much more recent than most we see. The reason for that centres on the fact that it was rebuilt at that time by John Barton. He lived in the village, but his home no longer stands. In the church is Barton's cadaver tomb. St Giles is notable for its exceptional collection of early Tudor carved poppy heads of birds, animals and angels. The room over the porch, dating from 1550, is known as Nan Scott's Chamber. Nan Scott was an inhabitant of the village who left her house to live in the chamber during the Great Plague of 1666. This is a Grade 1 listed church by the way, it forms part of a large group of local churches. They are in no particular order, Home, Langford, Winthorpe, Girton, Harby, South Skull, Bestorp, Thorny, North and South Clifton and both churches in Collingham. So even though most churches we see are 12th century or a little bit older, um, they still have some modern features, but this one for some reason seems to be very much old worldy. There's something about it, I don't know what it is, it just seems much older than most we see. Look at this, isn't that fantastic? This rude screen's it's, it's, you I mean, you look in real, real detail at it. You can tell it's been worn away. It's, it's weathered. It's certainly been used. It's certainly been around a while. Look at this, look at these. That's attention to detail right there, isn't it? It's fabulous. Even the organ looks really old, doesn't it? It's a great church, this. Absolutely fantastic. I'm loving it. This is Gothic Farmhouse, for me one of Holmes' standout properties. It's believed to derive its name from a former hostelry, which closed down sometime prior to the mid-1880s. This is effectively the centre of the village. Here we have a phone box, used now to house a defibrillator. This will be our finishing point later. Heading north up the high street, we come across the parish notice board, so you can mark home off the list, people. We're motoring through these Newark and Sherwood ones. There are, in fact, two notice boards, one for the parish church and one for the parish itself. Interestingly, one makes a reference to HBLT, whatever that is. Between them, there's a post box. 
So even though this is a dead end, whichever way I turn, I can turn this into a circular walk. If I head north up here, there's a footpath which I can use uh, to get back to where we were at the uh, phone box a few moments ago. It runs down the side of the River Trent, so it does form like a little loop. There's one landmark I'm hoping to find in particular, and that's the uh, cross on this side which marked the crossing point of the River Trent. You might remember the one on the other side in North Muscombe. Next, we have some interesting buildings. You're looking here at Home Hall, which dates from around 1800. It's not to be confused with the hall at Home Pierpont. It's made of red brick and has two and a half stories. Just a few paces away, you can just about see the top of a dovecote in the grounds of this building. They, of course, were designed to hold birds, despite their name, usually pigeons for their meat. Hidden away off the high street, you'll find what seems to be a small orchard just beyond that dovecote. It's a calm little oasis in an already peaceful place. In here, there's a bench which is seemingly dedicated to a local man. It's a little dark, so I'll read this to you. The bench was presented to Alf Cobb on his 100th birthday. That was a little hidden gem, that orchard, wasn't it? Certainly not the kind of thing you would see if you were driving along here. You were, you'd have to be walking past it to, to fully notice it. It was quite good, that. Now, uh, I was going to call this village uh, the village that time forgot, because as I've been walking up this road, I've been noticing how many old properties there are. But the further I go up here, and the more I realise there are actually um, newer ones. Seems to be the, his the historic village core is kind of the the uh, the center where the <clears throat> post box is and then the further north you go here the more you see these newer properties like for example this one here Fishing on this part of the Trent is under the sole jurisdiction of the Worksop Angling Association only members can fish the stretch between Winthorpe Lake and Cromwell Weir from here, you can follow the path all the way to Winthorpe Lake and beyond. The barges which lay within the lake would have once been used in the transportation of sand and gravel on the Trent. Soon enough, after you've walked for about a quarter of a mile, the level of the riverbank dips out a little bit and you come across, believe it or not, a small beach. Hey, who'd have thought this? Look, little beach on the River Trent. Amazing. I don't think you can get your deck chair and your parasol out here, though, I'll be honest with you. And uh, I noticed this wall here. I wonder what this is all about. Oh, it might not even be a wall, actually. It might just be... No, it's not. It's not a wall. You know what? From a distance, this looked like stone, but it's not. It's, uh, it's just where the bank has obviously eroded away at some point. I'm looking for the cross. You remember the cross on the other side of the river in North Muscombe? There is apparently one on this side. Where it is, I don't know, but apparently uh, it's uh, quite weathered and worn. So when we find it, it probably won't be in as good a condition as the one on that side of the river. Now we're back in a familiar spot. John Barton's now demolished house used to stand away to the right. It had a piece of stained glass which read, I thank God and ever shall, it is the sheep that hath paid for all. Near the crossroads is the stump of the cross I'd been looking for. This and the similar shaft found across the river at North Muscombe mark the place of the medieval crossing points of the Trent. Interestingly, other sources suggest the two crosses commemorate floods, but I find this to be unlikely. As was suggested in North Muscombe, this cross is clearly much more weather-worn. I was just about to give up hope of finding the cross, to be honest with you, because I thought it would have been on the riverbank. But no, it's here outside this farm, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it, because obviously the track I've just shown you is where people would have crossed the river, and this would have been the point that marked it just like on the other side brilliant i'm glad i found that it is definitely in a worse state than the one on the other bank isn't it absolutely it is but it did a job and uh, you know it's things like this which define the history in these kind of places brilliant glad i found that and that's really it 
there isn't much more to home than that. Um, very tiny rural village dominated by farming still and uh, you know some of it and the uh, sort of core here is still very much old. The newer sections of course are up to the north. Um, I think that way there's uh, generally speaking just uh, more farms than anything else. It's a dead end too but we're not walking down there because uh, I don't think it's worth um, nipping down there for anything. I don't think there's anything of note. And of course how about the church? The church of course is certainly the standout feature for me here. Brilliant, love this place. No picture bit today because it's too small, so it's time for me to move on to my next one here in Newark and Sherwood. Do hope you've enjoyed the parish of home. I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.